This is Hit Publish, the first podcast dedicated to uncovering and rogue businesses secretly navigating the ever-changing digital landscape. Each episode, we'll play host to leaders in their fields discussing their adoption of the latest digital trends and related technologies, addressing the total effects on the way we market businesses and brands across all of our industries. And occasionally, we'll pay homage to the technology giants who dictate our online lives and the platforms they provide reminding ourselves of the self-inflicted and inevitable misuse of personal data. So if this all sounds good to you, skip the terms and conditions, ignore the privacy policy, and hit subscribe. On this episode of Hit Publish. People want to go to the high street to have an experience, and the businesses that are there are not providing a good enough experience for the the consumers. Mm -hmm. Again, linking in with the purposes of the UK DRIC as a testbed for drone deliveries. 5G, you need a lot of nodes or a lot of masts, yeah. and yeah. Uh, that sounds expensive. It, it is, but who's going to pay the bill? We spoke to Emily and Jason from the UK Digital Retail Innovation Centre, the home of Hit Publish. We discussed what the UK DRIC is all about, the innovations it's trialling, and why Gloucester City has been selected as its base. We spoke about the latest innovations being carried out by startups trying to revolutionise the high street, and some of the cool ideas currently being tested right here in Gloucester. We'll have our usual five minute news updates and a reminder to please subscribe to Hit Publish, your digital marketing, online advertising, and technology inspired podcast. Hello, welcome back to another episode of Hit Publish. Um, nice to have you back, guys. Hello. Hello. Another, Hello. another round. Um, we're yeah. joined by Jason and Emily from UK Drick. Um, today, and we're going to talk about uh, well, the UK Drick in general, it, it, which has become our home of uh, Hit yes. Publish. It's, uh, <laughs> Welcome. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for, for giving us the space, first Obviously and foremost. you made yourself at home. So. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we're going to put some stuff up on the walls and just really cement our, our, our space here. And sell some massive portraits. <laughs> um, it's, it's great to finally have you both here and, and to a chance to talk about UK Drick. I know it's a, it's a good innovation and it's mm-hmm. great for Gloucester and, and what we're doing. So let's sort of jump jump straight into it um emily the the uk digital retail innovation center is what uh, what the drick stands for um that means shopping online does it or the center of everyone getting shopping online and wipe out our high oh, streets no 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 not at all <laughs> yeah. uh, you've got the wrong end of the stick there completely <laughs> this is a, a way to get to reinvigorate the high streets we are a test bed a place where people can try out new new projects new innovations to see what will work for the high street because we all know that the high street's dying. It's been on the radar for about a year. It's been on people's agenda and it's definitely flared up recently. Um, and we're here that we want to say, no, the high street is definitely not dead. People just need to adapt. Um, businesses need to upgrade and actually learn about what's out there that can inspire their customers to come to them. Why, why do you think the high street is dying? Or is it being perceived as dying? Um, no, no, no one's lying. I mean... Ugh. It's evolving. It's not dying. Things are changing. Consumers are changing. So yes, things are going online. There are an, an enormous amount of possibilities for people to buy their things that they buy in a shop now online. Smoother, more convenient for them. People want to go to the high street to have an experience. And the businesses that are there are not providing a good enough experience yeah. for the consumers. Mm-hmm. So now nowadays we need people who know their products. Know, know their consumers and know how to market themselves to those people to get them into their stores. Mm-hmm. And this is where we're here for people who have got these great ideas but are just, just uncertain about how to bring them into the market. Mm-hmm. So we've got a few projects lined up where they're brand new startups but just need that support of how to get it out to, to the businesses as well as the consumers. I've, I've asked this question before between us and it might be a bit of a controversial one. Okay. But I, I wonder who we're saving um, in the first comment, the, the high street for, why, who are we saving the high street for and why? Why does it need it? Why does it need it? We are saving the high street for the communities of a place, of a, of a city, of a town. People who rely on tourism coming, people who rely on the people who are living there. Um, admittedly, quite a few of the businesses on the high street are turning into residential too. The residents of that high street would also need to do their shopping, go out and enjoy themselves. They want to enjoy where they live. So we need to save the high street or reinvent the high street or change people's perceptions of what a high street is for for the future people, for the people actually living there and the future generations. I feel like the high street, as it is now, 
in comparison to what can be achieved online is somewhat inconvenient, right? Oh, it, yeah. It, I've got to drive into wherever, I've got to Absolutely. find parking. Um, that's going to cost me whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm then going to find the shop, go to the shop, and inevitably that shop isn't going to have what I want. Or mm -hmm. I can sit home on my couch and order something from Amazon and get it delivered same day or next day. That's very true. That's really? what you're competing yeah, with. We're very much so. I mean, everyone's competing against that. Yeah. Um, there are people out there who are trying to provide things that Amazon can't provide, can't sure. do. And this is where having an experience or an experiential time when you're doing your shopping, when you're out and about with your family, to give you that reassurance of where you're going is, is where you want to go, to make that effort to, as you say, pay for parking, find a parking space. Yeah. And not necessarily, you might not find what you want, you're looking for, but you find an alternative. Your eyes are open to a, a different thing that you didn't expect to be there. So that's where we think as the high street has to has to provide to increase dwell time and just the positive feeling of a place. So when when you say experiences, does sorry Chris, yeah, sorry, sorry, no, go on. You <laughs> when, when you say experiences, does the high street become? Um, and I think what is my my opinion doesn't matter, but um, does the high street become a place where you go for? meal a social so restaurants cinemas um bowling it becomes that kind of place not for shopping it becomes an experienced place a social place and you do shopping online uh i think it has to be a mixture of all okay. i mean the shopping online is going to consistently go and grow and people are going to do it yeah but it doesn't stop the people who are already in the high street to be able to offer the shopping too it'd be better to like for example let's go for a tea shop we don't have a tea shop in gloucester however people love tea i can see you're drinking a, a hot beverage there it's probably coffee but we'll say it's tea for now yeah <laughs> um, people want to have that feeling of going into a shop and people know their their product so you can get an idea of tasting for example a tasting thing rather than brewery you go and taste tea you come away you might not buy anything but you have a nice experience of learning about how the product is made um, how you can use it in your home and it, it just builds up that feeling of something you've learned so it's learning is a very good key yeah. to get consumers in so I think engaging with your customers and educating them about your products is, is a great way to not necessarily get them to buy something but it, your, the, the, that experience will stay with them as a positive one hopefully and still that experience might lead to an online sale so I have yeah, that exactly. experience on the high street but then I go home it, and it makes it. sense for people who are already on the high street to have an online presence We've got a good mix of age ranges in here, and I guess, I guess, uh, <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not that old. <laughs> we usually uh, take the piss out of Chris, but <laughs> yeah, I've taken that mantle. Yeah. Um, should who, who should we be catering for? Yeah. Who, who should the high street be catering for? Should we be catering to a, an older generation that have that nostalgia of going into a high street where they have a chat, meet the friends, do the shopping? With, or do we cater to a younger generation like Sam who potentially couldn't be bothered to go into town no, because of the inconvenience not. and would rather order online? Who, who's, who's the aim to... Why, why can't we cater for everyone? I guess you're absolutely right. And right now you can... Mm. But are, are you catering to a generation that is changing? That will, will oh, yeah, change? absolutely. I mean, there's not a lot thought about of the, the future generations of their consumer habits. Yeah, right. There are, there are a few people out there trying to find out where generations speak. That's the next one coming along. Okay. Uh, Group chats. Cool. Uh, where are they going to go? I mean, everything is like, oh, hello, Google. Please, you know, put this to my shopping list. Add this to my <laughs> shopping list yeah. and whatever. Yeah. Um, but... Again, that's not getting them to engage with the high street. So there are people out there trying to work out what people want with the high street later, you know, in 20 years. It's difficult to know what people want. If I speak for, for my generation, so that whole uh, experience piece of I go and meet my friends for coffee, yeah, that doesn't really work for me and my, well, as far as I know, my friends, because mm -hmm. we do a lot of talking in our group chats on yeah. our phones on WhatsApp and Snapchat and all these apps. So to go out and let's go have a chat over a coffee, that's a bit like... Isn't that sad though? I don't mean, I mean that, oh, you're a sad, <laughs> but I mean, isn't it sad that we're losing that, that, that yeah. intimacy? There is, there, is a, there is a little bit of that. Um, and actually, weirdly enough, so um, my friends that I don't see very often, I've got a group of friends that I went to school with, mm -hmm. I see them maybe five, six times a whole a year. Yeah. We make the effort to go and actually then go and have like a group meal or something to try and, I don't know, I guess if I speak from a psychological perspective, try and rebuild those bonds because we don't see each other very often. Mm -hmm. The friends I do see a lot, we're always talking to each other every single day, but just in group chats. Yeah. Um, if we meet up, we're like playing football or doing something. We're not actually, we're not conversating as much. So to no. go to the shops for a coffee and that kind of stuff, 
seems alien. Really so yeah, when, you, when you meet up, you're actually doing something together. You're having an activity. An activity you're yeah. being, doing social. And that's what we wanted to bring to the high street, having right. those social pods where people okay. meet. And not necessarily yeah. just have a coffee, yeah, but, okay. I don't know, play FIFA or something, aren't they? Like that. <laughs> that would actually <laughs> be <laughs> cool. What is it you kids do? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good example because obviously when, when the with the upcoming of the internet and of these social groups, you're no longer mixing just in a specific geographic area. Sometimes you're you're basically yeah. forming your peer groups among people who have the same interests as you. Yeah. Whether that's gaming or whether it could be knitting. Yeah. yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. But people are grouping up around those areas, and there's a very interesting example of that because you can go to a knitting shop, and whereas they might have just at one point sold wool, now they have a room behind it where you've got a group of people who are knitting, and they've formed their own community right. within the city centre. Yeah in their special interest. Yeah. And that perhaps gives an, an indication of perhaps one way that the high street will change, which will be about those more experiential uh, uh, shops yeah, yeah. Or, or retail outlets, where it's not just about going in and Transacting. buying, doing the mm-hmm. transaction, it's about building a community about something you're interested in. And that's where that experience comes in, isn't it? Yeah. It becomes more of an occasion. Yeah, I um, I've got some experience. I did this by accident. I just thought about it now. So when I was um, a few years ago, when I was just starting out, even when I was younger than I am now, well, yeah. <laughs> I was twelve years old. Um, I did some sort of uh, at my first year, I did some consultant work for this company, and they had a, a store at the local into, um, and they were saying, you know, how do we get people to to buy our stuff? And I had to. It took me a few weeks to pull on into them that. Yeah. You know, it'd be better if they spent money on building a, a great e-commerce store. We would do, you know, transact and buy. The, they sold kids bags, and I said to them, "Look, forget about selling bags in the store. Have five or six bags there for people to look at. But turn that little brand that they had, they had a cool brand going on for kids, into like a little experience they can come in and play and color in and all that kind of stuff." Mm-hmm. So, um, oh, that's interesting. You should say that. Yeah, but I'll save it for the news. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, I, don't, I can't say. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, it okay. really touches on that whole experience yeah. of shopping in the high street. But it's yeah, also yeah. interesting to talk about that in terms of technology, because yeah. one of the things that we're doing here within the UK DRIC is looking how some of those independent, very local-based retailers who have that one-to-one relationship with their customers mm. can utilise technologies to be able to go over that bump of the internet connection. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, actually, there's some really good examples of where that's been done very successfully because I'm sure all of us probably use Just Eat or Deliveroo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those people were going to, for example, my favorite burger place is a local independent. Mm-hmm. And they would never have been able to afford to have a whole set of delivery drivers. Yeah. But they're now buying into an internet ecosystem, which yeah. is able, enabling them to deliver something locally to their local customers. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we mustn't see technology as the enemy of the high street. Yeah, absolutely. Right, because it. what it's enabling businesses to do, if they understand how to do it, is to market to the market of one. So yeah. if you are a local independent, you'll be able to market eventually, and even today, to your customer in the same way that Amazon does. I and mean, wouldn't it be great if you own that local burger bar that when you immediately go onto the website or when I'm going past you on a Friday afternoon to say, okay, Jason, I know that you like your particular vegan burger in this particular way <laughs> with your rosemary fries. Yeah. Just the way is when I go to Amazon, they try and sell me sheds because they know I'm mad about sheds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and it's how we can do that for independent businesses and local businesses, as well as that connection with the, with the nationals is one of the things, one of the many things that the UK Digital Research Innovation Centre is learning so we can spread that learning through the UK. <laughs> And I think um, as we, yeah, as I said before, when we sort of hinted on this in our, in our little pilot, it's, you know, wouldn't the world be a, a sad place if there was no high streets, you know, and, and that died out. Um, and it's not a case of when businesses came online and had e-commerce, that was it, you know, everyone shops online, you know, for some businesses. I talked about an example where we're working with a local business that we're actually downscaling them, so to speak, from having an e-commerce site because it's not appropriate for their business. They are right the experience. Um, so, yeah, but it's using the right um right sort of digital marketing for mm. for those businesses really and there's always gonna I, we said before didn't we there's always going to be an element of shops and, and retail stores that you just can't shop online for them yeah. i'm not no one or i'm not going to buy a couch without going to sit on it first yeah yeah so there's always going to be an element of that storefront anyway i think i don't think yeah. it's going to disappear like you say it just needs to change it just needs yeah, to definitely. to update in line with uh with with the modern technology um, that we everyone's use today. so slow I mean uh, there was an element of being scared at the moment as well because th- things will cost 
money to change to evolve and people just don't know what the right thing to do is at the moment so dare i say the b word but brexit is having an effect on a lot of the high streets because people are uncertain of what what's going to happen if there's going to be a change if anything you know dramatic will happen to the high street itself so people are sort of waiting to see what will happen before they try but i really think they need to start thinking about it now yeah. rather than waiting for that that date which may never happen yeah so, yeah. so what is the uk trick doing then to help help the, uh, the businesses sort of yeah evolve into to what it needs to be or the high street even? at the moment it's trying to make people aware of all the possibilities and potential uh, low-hanging fruit for them to to be educated about where where we are as, as for retail at the moment um, and we are, are branching out to, to various towns and cities in, in, the, in the UK, asking them that, what, what's going working with them, what's going on with them, um, and how we can spread the news on what has done well and what the next big thing is. So it's, it's slowly but surely getting out there and just engaging with people. Yeah, and you can think about some of, the, some of the things that we can do for placemakers, because some of these are infrastructures like 5G, like free Wi-Fi. They're simple, simple things. Um, and we've got a history of, of testing those out. But there are people in different places saying, oh, God, we need, new we need new Wi-Fi, we need 5G, we need these other solutions, we need iBeacons. But who do they go to to take the advice, impartial advice, about what is the best solution? And so many different cities and towns around the country want to do something, but they don't know where to turn. And okay. what we're aiming to do is test those technologies and actually give them an honest answer and say, well, actually, if you're going to go for a Wi-Fi system, use this one. If right. you're going to use 5G, talk so to like these people. Or, yeah, like a triage. Yeah. Or don't do it at all. It's not <laughs> worth doing. <laughs> yeah. um, or, you know, it might be worth experimenting with that. And one of the, the big things we're doing is we're working with multiple developers who are looking at different solutions for the high street. Mm. Last year, we won the Association of Town and City Management Award. There's about 400 different cities and towns around the country. Uh, and abroad who were members of that for the best digital high street project. That's fabulous. It gave okay. us some brilliant learnings. We're a year on. We know it could do so much more. Yeah. But we're able to then to explain to other areas, you know, what were the key findings of that? What should they be doing in their places? Is there any, you know, key examples of success stories that have had, uh, UK Trick's very young, right? How long has it sort of been here? Oh, three months. Is it really only yeah. three months? Yeah, so that, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Although we've been working at it for yeah, about two years. Longer, but, but yeah, we've been up and... Okay, up you might not have then at this early stage, but are, are there any sort of success story? Are there any sort of things that have happened already that are really driving this force forward? Yeah, well, I think if you look about the reason that we received the government funding into this is because we were already doing those things within where we are, Gloucester, Okay. Um, already and so some of that test bedding we were doing already so for example the first and we're going back four or five years now the first place in the country where an integrated cctv 4g at that point and a fiber network went in with was actually in gloucester and that wow. got replicated throughout the country because it made tremendous sense to fit in your free wi-fi your cctv and your 4g so that was one example. Another example would be the work that we did with Google's Niantic Labs. And that was quite an interesting one because we were testing out field trip, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was worth places actually developing their own apps or whether there'd be an overriding one that we should say, well, actually, rather than spending money on developing your own app, use field trip. Very clever with Google Glass. You could walk around and give you a live tour, still active. Right. Um, and we here were the first place outside of the U US where we were actually uploading the data points to it directly. So we had a partnership with them. That was interesting because that migrated eventually to a game called Ingress. So some of the more geeky listeners will know that, which then became, which we all know, Pokemon Go. Yeah. And because we'd created this environment, which was forming the basis of Pokemon Go, yeah. with the original Field Trip app, we ended up with one of the richest environments for Pokemon Go in the country. All right. But more importantly, before Pokemon Go launched, we were able to go to the retailers within the city and say, right, in a couple of weeks' time, Pokemon Go is going to be launched. This is how you, as businesses, yeah. can actually benefit from it. So the day that Pokemon Go launched, in the cafes and the bars <laughs> and attractions, there were Pokemon laws, if you know what those are. And so people had posted these little laws outside, so yeah. they'd say, and they were posting on social media, come down at 
12 o'clock, right. have your coffee and your lunch here, and you can come and collect Pikachu or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Collect. And that showed a massive increase in footfall. That's great. And also, it benefited the businesses. Long term, of course, because we've got the wish environment, believe it or not, people are still coming in on Pokemon Go. Harry Potter is on the same system, and it's those same uses. We've also worked with uh, DASA, which is the Defence um, uh, Accelerator Program. They're developing an IB can solution. We've got one of the widest implementation of IP cons for the city as an infrastructure. Did we know what we we're going to do with it when we implemented it? No, but people, <laughs> but people have used it. And actually, in part, for us, where we are in terms of becoming an incubator for those ideas and a test bed, we have to have the infrastructure here to let people develop things. Yeah. So I think there's some, oh, and of course, as I said before, we won the ATCM Best Digital High Street Project for the um, the GL card, which is our place-based um, ecosystem. Yes. Yeah. So, so in three months, it's not too shabby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll credit that all into the last three months. Yeah. 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 But it's been that process leading up there. Mm. Should we do some news? Let's do some news. Sam, yes. get five minutes on the clock. Okay, Let's five minutes it. on the clock. Go. This is at, um, given what we're talking about, a, a, a high street, big name is is potentially coming back. Toys R Us are coming back um, and back in time for Christmas, only in the US, though, unfortunately. So True Kids Incorporated and CEO Richard Barry, uh, who is who used to be the executive of Toys R Us, plans to open half a dozen stores in the US by the end of the year. So this is interesting because we were talking about experience and that kind of thing. So the new model, apparently, of Toys R Us, um, although it'll have a slightly look or whatever, but still keep the brand name, is they are totally focusing on experience. Oh. So now kids, um, obviously, they can shop there and buy some toys. But in, instead of just that, they can come in and play. Yeah. So think a bit more early learning center where there'll be there'll be a coffee shop in there and there'll be yeah, areas for kids to play, a soft play and all that kind of stuff. And while you're there, you can buy your toys. But how about that? Toys R Us. What a, like a... It's a, a landmark, isn't it? Are you a uh, Toys yeah, R Us yeah. kid, are you? Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wouldn't have guessed. <laughs> yeah. I'm pleased about that. Sounds a nightmare for me. Like, as a parent going in there, imagine your kids having an amazing time playing on all this stuff. You're not going to get out of there with your wallet intact. Yeah. Are you, really? yeah, I just want them to bring Beyblades back because I can't get them. They were the one. <laughs> yeah. I used to love it. Yeah, I'm a big Beyblade kind of guy when I was young. <laughs> younger. Um, moving on, Google Image Search has re rehauled it, how it's worked. Have you seen that? Overhaul, no. sorry, how it's it. Yeah, yeah. If you do a Google Image Search now, um, so this is where you put in an image and you search on that. No, no, sorry. So I, I literally search, I don't know, uh, Coca Cola can yeah. and uh, images. Uh, images and then go to the image search. Okay. Um, now, if you click on an image, uh, fly out menu comes over to the side here um, right. on the right hand side, shows the image larger, but then it also pulls through nicely um, some content from that website. So, for example, I was trying it out yesterday and I just randomly Googled uh, beef stew. Uh, for, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> You're uh, going to get remarketed beef stew out <laughs> <laughs> and, and it showed loads of images and I clicked on one and it pulled it out, made it larger and it's sticky as well. So it sticks there and I can continue to scroll through images whilst the, the, the image I clicked on is in view. But then it also brought through some of the content from that website, including the recipe of how to make beef stew. That's just cool. Oh, that's that's, 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 a, good, that's yeah. a good improvement uh, and a good step up. I, I liked it. I thought it was good. Yeah. Facebook are hiring actual journalists to tackle their sort of fake news uh, problem Scandal. that they have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, again, perhaps another PR stunt, do you think? Yeah. We, we spoke in the last episode, actually. Facebook are opening a bunch of uh, pop-up coffee shops mm -hmm. in London that people can go into and talk about their privacy <laughs> settings and, uh, you know, what they can turn on yeah. and off. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a PR stunt. There was some big news about it yesterday, well, wasn't there? There was a big announcement it, it, Yeah, privacy. indeed, yeah. indeed, yeah. So, I mean, they're doing all the right things, but, yeah, read between the lines. But um, anyway, yeah, so the actual journalists. So right now it's curated through algorithms, AI. The, the news and AI. Yeah. So instead of that now, they'll still have that to, to, for the most part. But sort of the top stories of the day of such is will be a small team of under ten people in a I company. You're going to say under Globally. ten year olds. <laughs> 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 that makes more sense. Yeah. That will, like less than ten people working for Facebook, professional journalists know that will curate these these top uh, stories of the day globally. So that's a wow. really tiny team yeah. To, yeah. to handle that. So the, the stories will need to be big stories that are relevant. But obviously. surely they'll still need to have to use AI just for where you are as well. Because if you've got one for Europe, depends on which country you're going to be in. If they're formulating stories for that area, I don't want to read stories about 
France or no? Well, the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. What's wrong You've really taken Brexit to heart, haven't you? <laughs> no, you know, I, I'm it's dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's old news, you know. But uh, it's just interesting that we've got such a small team and mm. quite a, high, a few things at the moment on everyone's radio, but especially about the high street, is local news and people knowing where they're shopping, where they're living. Well, where they those, where those, news, yeah, yeah, where those news, how those news articles yeah. served will be out, out of the yeah. that will, that will So happen. what are they going to have? One doing Russian, one doing <laughs> Chinese, yeah, one doing it, Italian, it would seem one so. doing But it's, it's the right step forward, right? Yeah. To get rid of this fake news, let's ask yeah. actual humans, do it properly and yeah. hopefully we'll Won't get it. rid of the trolls saying it's fake news though. Oh, yeah. definitely yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to skip that one, Sam, because you can come on to, and, and do that one. I'm just going to, so we'll come back to you and you can okay. do that. But um, this one I thought was really cool. Amazon, um, have you heard of the... Uh, oh, run out of time. Oh, gonna turn it off. We're going to do it anyway because it's it's cool. Um, have you heard of the TV show, uh, the, the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? No. It's an Amazon Prime TV show. It's meant to be really, really good. It's got like 20 Emmy, nom- Emmy nominations yeah. coming up. And in the, uh, 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 an effort to raise awareness uh, for the the award ceremony that's coming up, um, Amazon are doing a big push for, for the marketing of it. So what they've done is, is they've uh, gone into a, a city, what was it, Sam? Santa, Santa Monica. Santa Monica. Uh, this show is set in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. And what they've done is they've partnered with a bunch of businesses in this town or city and uh, reduced all their pricing to what it would have been in the 1950s. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah. So that, that means that you could go and get petrol for 30 cents a gallon. Wow. <laughs> on, on this day uh, that they've they done this campaign. Yeah. But the trouble is with that is that when you sell petrol for 30 cents a gallon, you obviously yeah. get a lot of uh, uh, people that want to buy petrol. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> so much so that they had to shut the campaign down yeah. <laughs> because crazy. it was causing such a problem in the city and traffic and everyone oh, trying wow. to... And not, not just... Uh, I mean, it was everything from milkshakes to petrol to um, clothing and all sorts of it was yeah. just ridiculous pricing but it's a really good that. idea right because everyone was talking about it even if you hated the fact you couldn't go into the town <laughs> to buy anything for love nor money yeah. you, you knew what it was about and yeah. it achieved the results that it needed to achieve yeah. it's a clever yeah, it's clever bit of marketing yeah, publicity around that. Yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. I, I'm talking about it and I'm we're all the way over here. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Sam go on Uber yeah Uber uh, lost 5 billion in 3 months 5 billion US dollars so, what, their value or trading? No, in, in, in losses. Oh. That was, so, yeah, Uber's valued um, at $80 billion. Um, it's never turned a profit. And in the last three months, they lost a staggering $5.24 billion. But why is that? Is that because yeah, of just yeah. everyone shutting down Uber? No, actually. Is London shut it down entirely now? They shut it down and brought it back and shut it down. Yeah, yeah. I'm not okay. sure what stage is that now. Yeah. Um, but basically what, they ha- what happened was they paid $3.2 billion in stock compensation to the employees. So, you know, it's hefty, hefty salary. yeah. <laughs> salaries they're paying over there. Um, and the issue they're having is basically, um, so Uber started off to disrupt taxi services. The issue is now that they've kind of lowered the barrier to entry, there's lots of competition. So anyone, you know, who can, see people who can build an app can build an Uber. It's not even hard anymore. So they've got lots of competition. They've got to almost overpay for drivers because the drivers don't care if they're with Uber or Lyft, they'll go wherever it's busiest. So they're overpaying to get drivers in and to keep drivers on, but then they also have to discount the riders because if I if I you know if I move if I go to New York and you know Uber's you know surge charging me, I can just make a Lyft account and get thirty dollars off or whatever kind of interaction offer that they're making. So they're having to do lots of that kind of stuff, and it's just costing them an arm and a leg wow. to keep people in. Demise of Uber. Well, yeah. if UPS, we spoke about UPS earlier, and if yes. that is uh, if that continues to happen, you just won't need drivers anymore anyway. So <laughs> don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Cool, that's the news. Out, uh, what, 10 was minutes it? over? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that. You're yourself. Okay, so Emily, yeah, talking a bit more about the UK Digital Retail Innovation Centre specifically, is there any kind of, what other innovations are, are happening here or in the pipeline that you can kind of tell us about? Um, currently at the moment, we've got quite a few going on in the background. One I can tell you about straight away, they're, they're visiting us next week, actually, to come and have a, a revamp. They came earlier this month. There's a, a, a young company called Streetpin, um, just run by two blokes. Okay. Yeah, I've and heard about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting, actually. When you hear it, you kind of think, what's all that about? When you have a, a little play with it. It's they're, 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 doing, they're doing a lot of ads and, yeah, and stuff so, online at the minute. I keep seeing it. I, keep, I, I scroll past it, though. But I, oh, Tell me more. Said, yeah, well, okay. So these guys thought of um, what the high street is wanting, and a lot of it is about a community. And so they've created this digital pin board for the community of an area. 
<clears throat> they've tried. They've, they're set up in Orpington. They've done a trial in Croydon and Bury St Edmunds, focusing on one narrow street in Croydon and a, a monthly market that happens in Bury St Edmunds. They saw what we were doing with the launch of the UK Digital Retail Innovation Centre, um, found me online and said, can we come and do a project with you? We've got this one, we want to try it in a bigger area. They originally wanted to just try the whole of Gloucester and I said, why don't we focus on something a little bit more compact? And we went for the Eastgate Indoor Market, which is perfect for, for their product because a lot of the retailers in there are not digital savvy. Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea about that. Some may have a Facebook page. I think one has a, oh well, no, two have a, um, a website. Um, but this this product, the street pin, enables people who don't have a, um, a website to have a web presence mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. A bit like a Facebook page, but it's more interactive and it's a bit more current as well. So if anything, any offers they've got on there, say it's raining and they've got loads of umbrellas, they can go, we've got umbrellas here, come and find us. So consumers know automatically to go to them. So it's like a it. platform kind of thing. It's it a is a platform. It's platform. a platform. So it's a, a digital community pin board they're okay. marketing it as. That anyone, any consumers can just log on to it and have a look at it. You don't have to be a member, so you can see what the most relevant um, offers are, or even what events are going on. Okay. So, they, but all the all the businesses on there can have their own little page, and mm -hmm. those page can also be under another an umbrella one. So there's one specifically for the indoor market, which all the other pages are underneath it. Right, right. So right. you can always see what's been added to that page. What's recent. It's interesting because we spoke in a previous episode mm. um, about how relevant websites might be in five years time when mm -hmm. there's platforms like this available. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We spoke about how um, uh, Instagram is be uh, uh, social e commerce. commerce. Yeah. So um, I can buy products directly through well, Instagram. Strangely enough, we're talking about Instagram. We've got a, a lovely workshop happening next month, specifically looking at Pinterest and Instagram, yeah. how it's becoming e-commerce. And Pinstagram, Pin uh, Pinterest even. Sorry, <laughs> you merged yeah. a new one. <laughs> there's, a new, there's a new one right there. Um, Patent it, go. Actually, Pinterest is selling more than in, in Instagram. So there's more right. sales going through that platform. I can see that. Than, yeah. than Instagram. Yeah. But yeah. you think uh, how long ago Pinterest yeah. came out yeah. and it sort of died down and now it's coming back up again and mm -hmm. more retailers are using that as a, as a scrapbook of all the stuff that they've got. And then, and then, yeah, people are just buying through that, which I thought yeah. was interesting. Sorry, a bit of a byline yeah. there, but it's just gone. Yeah. But that's it. That's what's interesting. And and you saying about those businesses down in the market, I think yeah. it's easy for us, kind of in the in the digital tech game, a little mm -hmm. bit. You just kind of Do it. assume that yeah, yeah, people have got websites and all that sort of stuff. But actually, there's a, a no. lot of businesses that haven't. So it's bringing bringing those up to an yeah. online presence and exactly, and, and telling them it's not it's not scary and it's, it, there are easier ways of doing it. So very kindly, the manager of the market are look, is looking after those pages for those people to educate them on how to use it. Yeah. So telling them even to how to take a photo of the product and getting it online, it, it seems very simple to us guys around here. Right. Yeah. But, but people who are, are not brought up with that, who don't know the ins and outs of it, it's alien. It, it's, mm. it's scary to them. You right. know, they're uncertain, and I think that just scares them a lot. And I think linking to that, I've seen that uh, you'd run a um, about getting businesses online and making mm. the most of the digital sort of marketing yeah. tools out there. You had Google um, in, didn't you? Yeah, we did for our launch. It was absolutely amazing. And we'll definitely get them back in again. But digital Google Digital Garage, get my teeth in today. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, it was just maybe re-educating a few people, but having that brand here, visiting us here to show what, what the potential is for Google, for people to understand it. Like even Googling my business, which I know you've lost a bid, have just gone out to all their members to say, have you Googled your business? Because it's... It's easy to do, it's free, it gets you more visible online. Um, but mm -hmm. it's always all right saying for the place people are saying it better, but hearing it from Google itself, it's sort of... That brand cloud it, yeah, it's, that it's, you get with, yeah. It's the reassurance for people knowing it's, oh, it's that brand, yeah. I believe what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That, that trust that you have. Yeah. Okay. Google My Business as well is turning into a bit of a platform in itself. Oh, absolutely. Like, there's yeah. so yeah. much, uh, we added, um, you can now add your services to it. You can do, um, and you can purchase through it. Coupons, like coupons yeah. Oh, can you? I think yeah, you, you can. Um, so they're I putting can... a lot of investment into it because mm -hmm. since they closed down um, Google, Google Plus, Plus, which is a massive yeah. failure, <laughs> 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 they're putting all the all the effort into that. So you, it's almost like a social platform in itself, in that you can post things to it, and yeah. those posts will yep. appear in search results. Yeah, um, but it has a time. It has a, a thirty a days time limit. So yeah, if you yeah, post noticed. something on Google uh, on Google My Business. Um, I think it's 30 days, it kind of expires and disappears. So yeah. that encourages people to keep putting fresh That's content on there. It's similar to what Streetprint is. So you yeah. can put things on there for a certain amount of time. 
it can, you're in charge of it when you put it on there. It can be, it defaults to a week, but it can be like an hour if you've got an offer on for like you want to get like rid of it. Like a flash sale. Yeah. But end of midnight for a week, for up to a month, up to 60 days is the maximum. But you have, you're in control of that. Yeah. So again, it's just it almost sounds back. like it's like a mini local yeah. Facebook, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, like Facebook yeah. business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but then you don't, you don't have all those troglodytes that want to come in and give sure. you harassment. It's, it's kind of like a, a safe space then, a yeah, safer exactly. space for small businesses. Yeah. Okay, do, cool. do small businesses have the option to sort of, I'm assuming there's a monetary gain in the platform is, so they can yeah. pay to uh, all, feature higher yeah, or something? It all depends on the advert. So at the moment sure. it's, it's free for people to put the offers on. Yeah. Um, but it's a, a payment for putting it on a certain pin board. So okay. within fifty meters, uh, 250 meters of a pin board, you can then advertise on that pin board depending on where you are. So, okay, so this is location to, based. Yeah, it's location oh. based. So, uh, so literally, I bring up the app when I'm standing in a particular town, in a particular yeah, area of that yeah. town, and it will show me what's relevant it's within only that as geographical location. a web page at the moment. Yeah. But again, this is a, a brand new startup that yeah, comes to us for help. Yeah. Right. And just to, just to play with it, and I've already found a few glitches that he's going to iron out, and hopefully be prepared for next week. Um, but yeah, it's location. So oh, cool. you'll visit a place, open up Street Pin, and it will find you and go, "Oh, look, did you know there's a cafe around here?" Or Come and play what is it using us. to do that, Jason? You probably know that. Is it beacons or is it um, or is it just literally GPS? It's GPS at the moment okay. and, and working with Google. So they're <laughs> in negotiations with um, Google to just make it a bit more refined. Okay. And hopefully, um, either, is, it, is it three words that you can work out where which height what you're at? What three words? What yeah. three words and things yeah. like that. So at the moment, obviously, it's only bird's eye view, but there are lots of buildings that have got three floors to it yeah right. so if you want to find out where exactly they are they're probably working with the that that type of technology to, to, um, to find which floor they are in yeah like for example Debenham's got five floors if you want to look at for a certain place you're gonna to have to go through all of it but unless you know it's like oh it's on the first floor no one's going straight away. Uh, yeah. yeah yeah oh cool and you mentioned um, previously about the, the, you won the award or uh, Gloucester did for the uh, GL card yeah well GL card brilliant, brilliant, that... brilliant thing yeah it's um it came around in 2017, thanks to rewarding visits, winning um, innovation fund money. Came to yeah. Gloucester going, oh, well, let's try it out here. So we did. It replaced our residence car. So I don't know if you were around a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. okay. The yeah. residence car came in. It was specifically for people of a certain postcode to get it. But now we've opened up being the GL card. It's for people who live, work, educate, but also visit the place too. So it's like a little visitor's card to come here and they get... To to know what all the hottest offers are on, um, the, the events that are happening nearby or when they're on as well. And it works with our kiosks, which print out vouchers. for So So some people only want a limited amount of vouchers available to people, say like 10, and mm-hmm. that will get them 50% off in a meal. Then they have the, the consumer has to physically go to those touch points to print out those vouchers right. and then take them to the, the relevant businesses to get that discount. So it's not open to everyone. There are very exclusive deals that you can get. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's very very popular and ever growing. And you get ten percent off all your booze at one particular pub as well, don't you? What yeah. brewery? No. So that's <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> it has no, been very honest, popular. It's very very good. It's again, it's got to that point though with it. We we need to know what the next step is with it. Yeah. Because so many things are changing, and people are, are as we were talking about earlier, the habits of how to shop or where to find the, the greatest things. A lot more loyalty of a brand is coming out rather than looking where you can find the cheapest thing. So we're, we're sort of we're, we're talking to the um, rewarding visits next week to see where the next stage is. But he's got a, another project up his sleeve as well. That's an interesting. You, well, sorry, Michael. Yeah, because um, a lot of times, sort of businesses, and if you're in, uh, if you're an accountant, I'll be just break straight on Tonga. If you're looking at um, business from an economic perspective, mm-hmm. most of the time you're thinking, um, you know, price and you know you think your consumers are trying to maximize the price, but actually a lot of the time you're satisficing. Mm-hmm. So what you're doing is trying to find a happy medium between what I'm happy to, to prepare to pay, what I, the experience I expect. Yeah. Um, so people aren't actually always looking for the, the, the cheapest option no, or the most no, discount. They're actually looking for the brand that I like, the yeah. service that I like and the product that I like. Yeah. That's quite cool. It's quite interesting. Do you, do you think the likes of um, the GL card and uh, was it Pinpoint? Uh, street, pin. Street, pin. Street, pin. Pin. street pin can compete with other similar platforms. So, I mean, I'm talking about Facebook. Ultimately, Facebook can provide a similar offering to, to GL as a business page, to the GL card as a business yep. page, and obviously can also provide something similar to the pin boards that, that you've yep. got. How do you think, why would I go to those apps instead of something that 
you typically know off the bat? I, I think specifically you, you get more of a place orientated thing um, for those those brands because you're you're going to that place and it is, for example, the GL card is a place card. It, it is for Gloucester mm-hmm. um, and Street Pin, as we were saying, it, it, it will find out where you are, yeah. and find you what's what's local for you. Yeah. Instead of, I mean, we all do it. We all go on Facebook and have a trawl through. I don't necessarily personally myself look for but, what's near me and what's yeah. going on near me i will be notified by it um but to, to find out myself um, what if um a bit controversial no, no. but facebook are known to and instagram just steal features oh i know <laughs> <laughs> so what if they did basically see you know someone in facebook's dev team saw a mm-hmm. uh, street pin and joe card and thought oh we can do this and just go copy paste they could do it they, 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 they could do it you know so many technologies that are being developed that are about places yeah. that they could come and carbon copy yeah. them and take them across. Yeah. I mean, the benefits, as Emily said before, about developing things that are specifically related to place, and this is brought up by Bill Grimsey on his report on the high street, okay. is that they are focused around what makes that particular place unique or different. You right. know, we don't go to a different town because it's exactly like where we've come from. <laughs> Yeah, we go to it because it's different. Yeah. Sure. And one of the issues of the high street is you've ended up with carbon copy high streets everywhere. Yeah, yeah I hate clone that. Towns. Yeah, you get this yeah. whole clone town thing. Um, but you know, it is always going to be a risk. I mean, like the big one I always think about is footfall sensors. You know, there's a lot of people competing in the footfall sensor market. But if you actually think about it, if a telecoms company or Google decided that they were going to deal with footfall, yeah. with the data they've got, they could wipe out every single. Yeah footfall sensor company in the country in one fell swoop assuming they could overcome all the gdpr constraints <laughs> yeah yeah but you know that they know where we are when we're driving along and we're using google maps or yeah, we're using apple maps which are taking google data mm. you know they know they know where we are they know who we are and they know what we're doing so <laughs> there is the poten- yeah well there's the potential there but whether they want to actually be that have that much control of of the market is a different matter right yeah. because it would present them with its own problems yeah okay can I ask, how are you reaching um, your customer, or who are the, the customers for the UK Drick? Who, who is your typical uh, business that you, you want to educate and bring into, into UK Drick? Well, we've, we've, got a, we've got a number of different uh, customers, if you like. Yeah. The one is the fact that we're using the whole of this city as a test bed for, for different technologies. So one of those is the, the actual retailers that are within the city. Mm-hmm. Um, because we're going out to them saying, well, these are solutions that you can try. You know, if you're not engaged with the internet, how you can do that. So that has real benefits for them in engaging with their customers. And we're hoping we'll get le- lessons from that, which you can take out elsewhere. And what kind of advice are you going to them with them? Well, of course, some of it's training. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of the stuff we talked about with, um, with, uh, do, uh, with Google Digital Garage, whether it's yeah. Facebook, whether it's actually, you know, look at these different apps. We talked about Street Pin, we talked about the, the GL card ecosystem. These are helping them connect with the market one. We're also using some of the technology from Maybe Tech, which is giving retailers a really good insight to how successful their social media and web presence is and what they can to adjust it. Um, so that's one area. The other should area, just say, actually, sorry to interrupt. We're speaking to Polly. Polly, Polly maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, she'll yeah. she'll give you a, a good insight into how it works. Yeah. And you know, actually, one of the things we'd say is, yes, if you're a place use maybe tech mm. and it's, it's a it's a good way of analyzing how you are as a city i suppose we would say that and it's probably if you want to look at success for the uk drick because gloucester is about i think the 74th 76th side city in the uk and on the uk digital rankings we rank at number nine and that's increased in the time the uk digital retail innovation center has been here okay so you know we know that we're doing a good job here yeah it's and working and i think that's a big thing and we'll talk about that as you said with with polly but um it's a it's an example of something trialing with the drick um is that it's that connect between the digital marketing mm-hmm. and and driving people to the place yeah. and bringing people to the towns and saying to those businesses connecting use facebook and twitter and all those things and you'll drive more footfall through through your doors sort of yeah. thing yeah the, the other the other customers i suppose if you want to think about them as customers would be those um particularly startup tech companies or companies which have um, a tech that they want to test on a citywide basis as as a, a proof of concept or a proof of activity okay. uh, and saying, well, actually, you know, can we try it? We talked about street pin, we talked about um, the, the GL card ecosystem, which received about a, a million of Innovate UK mm-hmm. funding. And Gloucester was one of the, the key places where that was tested. So that also is a key thing. You know, is there somewhere that is open 
to testing technologies. The iBeacons was a great situation there because an iBeacon provider came and said, we want to, inst we want to in implement uh, a full installation across the city. And they were having difficulty getting through the general sort of bureaucracy of trying Paperwork. to do with, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do I put 400 of these things across the city? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. you know, how do I get permissions from landlords? Mm -hmm. um, it took us less than 24 hours to get the permissions oh, wow. and for them to be able to install it just because of the relationship we have in this, in this city right. and in terms of the way that now the UK DRIC is making sure that we're putting that at the forefront. So, you know, we are open to helping innovators to get developed. So actually it's like tech startups. Yeah, could be quite a good one. Yeah, tech startups would be a really good one because they, or even bigger tech companies who want to actually do an implementation yeah. of a new technology, new ideas, and new ideas, and test them on a citywide or, as we said, with street pin, even on a smaller community yeah. basis. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other element is is placemakers, um, and um, you know that's quite an important one for us. We work with the Institute of Place Management, um, and uh, with the Association of Town and City Management, who are our partners here to be able to, again, spread those learnings to other place managers. So we talked about 5G, we talked about Wi-Fi systems. You know, if we can test something here and give an answer yep. back to those other cities and towns around the country and say, don't do it, do do it, this is the best solution, save or we don't know time. yet, yeah, yeah. it'll save them time and money. Yeah. Because so often, certainly at local authority level, people are chucking a huge amount of investment to something that becomes redundant within three, four years. And, uh, you know, yeah. at the beginning of the wave, like we are, you know, five years ago, we did this CCTV, uh, 4G and the free Wi-Fi system. Yep. Actually, we know now we need to change that. But there's some people who are still installing that system that we installed five years ago. Yeah. Wow. OK. Yeah. 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 And so we should be saying, well, actually, this is that area. Um, and another area would be actually some of the larger retailers. So the, for example, the Association of International Shopping Centres. You know, they're looking at what's happening here within Gloucester and seeing what learnings they can do because it's not just about the technology, it's about the repurposing and reimagining of the of the high streets in our city centres. So you guys are sitting here in the UK drip today. This is a very nice techie set of offices and buildings inside a for an, a former or actually actually is an active community shopping centre. Yeah. yeah. You know, there are two hundred of these up and down the country which all have a problem with their second floors. Mm. We've already proven something, which is actually if you convert it to office space, people can use people it. Use it. Yep. Now yeah. that's actually a relatively new learning, but already like a dominoes, you're seeing retailing shopping centers up and down the country going, actually that's a fabulous use of space. Yep. Yeah. And it can help. And for the high street, it's good because if you have an issue with voids, with, with vacant uh, mm -hmm. shops, obviously that brings down the feeling of it being a yeah, vibrant yeah. place. Yeah. Mm. But if you were, for example, to take a shopping centre like this community shopping centre and moved 20 shops or 30 shops out of here back onto the high street, yeah. you'd suddenly reduce your vacancy rates down to a few percent yeah. in yeah. one fell swoop. Because yeah. in most towns and cities around the country, it's actually not a, it's not a matter of hundreds of shops are empty. It's a handful. It's, it's, it's under 100. Oh, right. You know, or it's tens. Yeah. yeah. But it make it feels as if there's a lot the of the aesthetics of it. Yeah. The aesthetics of it. So, you know, you know, it's, that's one of the clever things that we can be doing as well. So I suppose does that give you an idea of our, our quite wide mandate? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got, yeah, there's a lot going on. It's I mean, a big job. How are you getting this out to people to know that you know, this is what you do and well, we're what on the a marketing... very good podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> you, that's ticking a box, yeah. <laughs> That's, that's not the pro that is of course the prime way we're doing it to the podcast. Um, we've got a, a good social media presence, but we do a lot. Emily and I do a lot of speaking at conferences. We're getting out there and speaking about it. Um, the uh, the uh, head of the local enterprise partnership in Gloucestershire is a lady called Diane Savory, mm -hmm. and um, she sits on a lot of um, high street task force, okay. and she's going out and, and singing that message mm -hmm. wide and far. The, the place was open here. The UK Drip was opened by Margot James, who was the Minister for Digital at the time. Of course, we've got another one now. Um, and uh, uh, next week, we have eight ministers from BEIS coming down uh, who are coming to see what's happening within this centre yeah. and what learnings there are that we can take further out. And then, of course, the relationship with the ATCM, yeah. with all their members as well. Yeah. I, I call that shaking hand and kissing babies. Yeah. yeah. So, and, hand to hand sort yeah. of thing. And yeah. also the, the, future, the future High Street Task Force. Now, that's going to be a really important one. 
that was awarded to um, Manchester Met University. Okay. Um, 10 million to develop a, a task force that's going to go from town and tap town and city to city, actually saying these are some of the things that practically you can do as place managers, as retailers, to convert your town to somewhere that's not showing success, to somewhere that is showing success. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly we've been invited to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. And yep. assuming that all goes through, we'll be involved with that. <laughs> and hopefully going out to those places along the tar side task force and saying, you know, the element that we can help you with is, and then, yeah, so lots of, well, like you say, shaking hands, et cetera, so talking about it. But what about, are you doing any sort of online paid advertisement to, to get the work? Because your targeting would be quite easy, right? It would be, I don't know, Glock, five business owners, five miles with Gloucester. Yeah, well, we have got some marketing out there at the moment. We're working with um, lead, Leading Edge Only, which okay. are, they, they brand themselves as the dating agency for small, innovative ideas yeah. with the big brands. Okay. So they've got a, a great interactive web page and it's it's global. It's not just UK based. And they do a great education piece as well. So there are different tabs, ones for um, big people, small little babies, and then education. Okay. So we are on advertising on the university's page. So alongside you study at the University of Arizona, there's also a UK Digital Retail Innovation Centre advert, which takes you through to our, our website, how you can get involved and things like that. So it's interesting to hear that. So are those like display ads? In a sense, yeah, it's a rolling ad on on their website. Oh, okay. So yeah. yeah. So it sounds like you're not, you're not make, not doing a sort of paid advertising in the sense of uh, targeted ads, targeted ads through Google or through social or anything like that. No, Is there a have, reason why? Uh, we I have done a few on on um, Facebook before. Oh, okay. It, depending on what we have on, so depending on what training we're giving, I will then obviously target the right people on on Facebook for that for that advertising. Yeah. Are you doing um, that? Sorry. No. Like, I could get, um, I could talk all day about that kind of stuff. Well, um, you, you can you, always help me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Are you doing that? Um, are you hitting the boost button or are you actually going into Facebook's ad manager and, and doing that that way? Or I've you done engaging? one boost and I've done one ad Ooh. manager. No, no, no. Okay. I was trying it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's all new to me as well. No, 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 so, no, no, so, you know, no, no, no. I'm a tick box for the UK Digital Retail Innovation Centre yeah. myself. So, <laughs> Great. no, I did, yeah, I did ad manager for the first one. So, I okay. the ad centre for that. Um, and it, it worked well. It got a really good reach for oh, it. Good. And the other one, I did a boost for it, just because, yeah. just, just, just to see what the difference yeah. was, really. How are you measuring the success of that? I mean, that's an easy measurement to do, something like yeah. Facebook ads, but things like the, the, the shaking hands and the, um, the website that you mentioned there where you've got a placement ad, yeah. how are you measuring if that's giving you anything? Well, the thing is, at the moment, because we've only been open three months, it's quite hard <laughs> to relate it to something. Sure. I, mean, I, I, I would say we're drowned been... under opportunity. Yeah. And um, particularly with LinkedIn, because... We post videos, we post mm. posts on LinkedIn, yeah. and the, you know we're in such an exciting market at the moment. Everyone's yeah. talking about the area, and whether we're at a conference or whether we go to whether it's through mm. LinkedIn, we just get a, a whole draft of people coming and say we want to be involved, we want to be involved. Oh, right. And okay. so you know it's not a case of us having to go and chase no. anybody for this. Okay, it's, oh, cool. really it's coming to you. It's, yeah. it's coming to us. It's more a case of us filtering what's worth spending the resource right. and time yeah. on actually dealing with and sometimes it's the people who you know work hardest at it and sometimes it's because something just really grabs our attention and think yeah. actually that that should be the key for it okay i wanted to pick your and this is of a personal interest really i i wanted to pick your brain about 5g okay. oh. yeah. um i know i i'm been in gloucester for very long at all um but i when i sort of first moved here i know that Marcus in Gloucester, um, particularly yourself, was quite a, an innovator in, in getting four or one of the first first cities to get four G in it mm -hmm. and uh, the Wi Fi in, in the in the city, etc. Um, and done really well there. And it was, it was uh, we were all jumping on when when it kicked off in the office. I remember we all mm -hmm. all jumped in it and uh, yeah, we were making use of it. So what, what's the crack with with five G then? Is it, are, are we following the same footsteps? We want to be one of the first cities to. I mean, I think it's in a handful of cities already, isn't it? Yeah, like, it's in a handful yeah. of cities yeah. already, and they've been testing it at various places. Canary Wharf was the big the big mm -hmm. test bed for certainly for EE. Yeah, um, and we've been having conversations with the head of. Uh, 5G for EE, and uh, we're hopeful that we'll get it in here. Certainly, what we've been talking about is how we can use it uh, again, linking in with the purposes of the UK DRIC as a test bed for drone deliveries, because that's one of the key elements. Is 5G is not just about communication or be able to download your movie quickly, sure. it's the increases that you can have in productivity. And there are some yeah. studies which indicate that if you can bring in ultra fast 
uh, connectivity, it can increase productivity by as much as 10%. Right. So it is going to be important. What's probably as important is that we actually have an ultra fast fiber backbone because it might be, it'd be great to stick a load of 5G masts up and aerials, but if we don't yeah. have the ultra fast backbone to deliver it, yeah. which presently the UK hasn't got, right. then it's, it's no good. So I was particularly interested, not just politically, but also logistically to see whether um, what Boris Johnson promised when he was standing on the, on the doorsteps of number 10 was going to be true. Yeah. If he really is going to accelerate it so that we're going to have 5G by 2025 yeah, it's ambitious. Or, or 2030 right across the country and it's completely pervasive, um, it would be a really good thing for the country. We need it. It's desperate. Yeah, it's yes. desperate need it. And if anybody's tried to have open reach fit um, anything. I mean, our, one of our, I have to say this, one of our delays to the launch of the UK DRIC was waiting for OpenReach to actually install our, yeah. our fiber. That's painful. I, and, I, it, and, it, and that's a learning. Yeah. That's a learning we can yeah. share with everybody. <laughs> no, if it takes you three or six months for them to fit fiber in, Ooh. it's just not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, that's affecting the productivity of businesses up and down the country. It's madness, isn't it? Yeah, how long you said yeah. that took compared to a lot of the service industries. You can order someone on Amazon and it'll be here tomorrow. <coughs> so it's, uh, yeah, getting, getting something like that. Getting something to installed. enable you to order Amazon. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, I, I watched a, a, like a, not a podcast, sorry, a uh, YouTube video Marcus. about, uh, yeah, Marcus Brownlee about 5G and how that's working, the technology behind it. So um, as you probably know, it works on high frequency waves and uh, like with anything, the higher the frequency, the less range um, it gets. So it gives the impression that in order to deliver 5G, you need a lot of nodes or a lot of masts. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that sounds expensive. It, it is, but who's going to pay the bill? So you know, none of the 5G operators are actually expecting anybody a place to, to get foot the bill. In fact, what places can do, cities and towns can do, is they can look at it as a revenue opportunity. Okay. Because it's multiple masts that are being positioned in multiple areas across the, across a particular city. If you're a local authority, which are, will generally own a hell of a lot of the city or have rights to it, it's an opportunity to make some money. So, you know, ultimately, we as a consumer are going to be paying for it when we're paying for our 5G <laughs> access. And yeah. people will be paying now 60 quid if you want to, 70 quid if you want to get a, a decent yeah, phone with 5G yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a month. But... Um, so I don't think it's a, neg a negative thing at all. And that, you know, as far as talking to EE are concerned, they've done their sums. They think it can work. Um, what's more worrying is that bit behind it. Yeah. You know, if you go to cities where they haven't got the fibre pervasively, you can't even think about doing 5G. Yeah. But interesting, you said, um, yeah, it was something Boris put in his, his you know, talk when and he's on the steps of number 10 or whatever. So it's, it's clearly quite a priority or he's putting it, you know, putting it up there as... as Something important to the to the country and something he sees as a either a, a vote winner or point. something that yeah. he wants to. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that, isn't it? And that's mm -hmm. the first time you, I think you've probably heard any prime minister put down full fibre, ultra fast connection to activity okay. as yeah. a vote winner. <laughs> when you think about it, it makes sense. When, when when you buy a house, the first thing my kids do when we bought a new house was look at the connectivity and see whether they get fibre in there. <laughs> yeah. 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 And if it wasn't, then they wouldn't be vetoed. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Um, guys, we've we've run out of time. Oh, well, we, we have. Okay. We can we come back again. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. by all means. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, thank you so much for co coming on. It's been uh, nice chatting with you about, about the UK DRIC and, and other things surrounding it. H how can we? How can people reach you? Oh, we've got a, a good website. You can find us on there. Um, LinkedIn, probably best one to go through. UKDRIC.org. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, there we are. Um, Facebook, Twitter, find us on those ones. Awesome. Connect. Great. Yeah. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please remember to subscribe if you haven't already. And most importantly, leave us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts as it really helps us bring you new episodes regularly. If you've got something to say around digital marketing and would like to feature on a future podcast, please do get in touch in any of the usual ways. You've been listening to Hit Publish with myself, Chris. And me, Ian.